Parashat Vayigash is a very moving parasha. Every year we read it, we are moved. It is very emotional to see the brothers of Yosef coming together with Yosef. Yosef revealing his identity to them after not seeing each other for 22 years. You can imagine the hugs, the kisses, the emotion between them. In all of this commotion, the brothers of Yosef finally figure out something that was bothering them for a while. They had many questions. They were puzzled by the behavior of the Shalit of Mitzrayim, the ruler of Egypt, of Yosef, who they didn't know was their brother. They didn't realize what was happening to them. They got back their money. Yosef's brothers had many questions that were disturbing them all along. All of those questions were answered in one moment. The moment Yosef said, Ani Yosef, <laughs> Ani Yosef, that you sold me to Egypt. Once they heard that, all their questions were answered. Now they were able to understand everything that had transpired that had happened with them all along. In the same way, the Hafez Chaim Zechit Tzadik of Rachar used to say, the Jewish people have many questions about what has been happening to them in almost 2,000 years. There are many things we can't figure out, we can't understand what is going on. But eventually, when the time comes and Mashiach arrives and Hashem reveals Himself, and Hashem says, Ani Hashem, we all will understand at that time why everything happened the way it happened. What was the meaning behind everything? So right now we're with questions in our mind, but sooner or later all those questions will be answered. Yosef and his brothers finally are able to sit down and have a conversation about just about everything. They have a lot to catch up. One of the questions that the brothers of Yosef for sure asked him is, tell us, Yosef, how did you spend all this time in Egypt and did not assimilate. You appear to be the same Yosef. Because they suspect that who knows what happened to him. So Yosef, please tell us, what did you do that you were able to maintain your identity as a Jew? After all, it's not easy. And Yosef tells them, first of all, look at me. It's me. Yosef, you have any doubts about it? I'm the one speaking to you. What does that mean, I'm the one speaking to you? Because he began to speak to them, Lashon Kodesh, Hebrew. Until then, there was an interpreter, he was speaking Egyptian. That's the simple meaning of the words, You don't trust that it's me? Look, I'm speaking to you now in your language. And when somebody speaks a different language, even though you knew him, you may not be able to recognize him. Now, because he began to speak their language, if they got a closer look at him, even though so many years went by, they would be able to figure out. That's the simple meaning of the words, But what Yosef is also saying is something else. It's me. It's the same Yosef. I haven't changed. I was always proud of who I was. And even though they made fun of me, they called me all sorts of names, I did not change. means I was never ashamed of being a Jew. I never changed. I was always makpid, always strict to maintain my identity, no matter what they did to me. I did not allow them to influence me. But there's something else in the words, It's the same language. It's the same tone the same vocabulary, even though he became older, he did not pick up the slang of the Goyim. One has to be very careful in how he uses his language. Rabbis tell us that words are very powerful. And some people misuse the words and copy what the Goyim say, what they, what they hear from Goyim. All sorts of bad language, foul language, slang. And no, Yosef is the same Sadiq speaking to them, to his brothers, in the same clean language that he was always known to speak. We talked about, I mentioned the fact that Yosef was not ashamed. He was not embarrassed of who he was. This is a very important factor because, unfortunately, in society, a lot of people assimilate only because they're ashamed to be different. That is one of the things that brings people closer together because they don't want to be different. And not only does that bring people closer to assimilation, it also prevents those who have become distant from Judaism from doing Teshuvah because they're afraid, what will the neighbors say? What will their co-workers say when they, they come the next day wearing a kippah? What will their friends say? How will people look at them? Some people are very concerned about what impression they give on others. Others are stronger and more courageous and they couldn't care less what people will say. But the majority of people are very much influenced by what people say. And therefore, it prevents a lot of people from doing what they really sh- want to do in their heart, what they really want to do, because of, of the shame that they may have to go through. And that's too bad. I always tell those who are ashamed, aren't you more ashamed of Hashem? (laughs) 
If you have to be ashamed, who are you more ashamed of? Of Hashem or of people, of your neighbor? Choose. But this is a very, it's a very big problem in society. The people are, are always doing things based on what others will say. And that is why the rabbis, in anticipation of all of this, put into our siddur several blessings to strengthen the pride, strengthen Jewish pride. Every morning when we got up, we say the following blessings. Shalom Asani Goy. We're very happy that we were not made goyim. There's nothing wrong with the goyim. There's some very good non-Jewish people. But we are proud of who we are. Hashem gave us the opportunity to serve in His army, to fulfill His commandments. And that is what we mean by we say, when we say, Shalom Asani Goy. It's not a negative, uh, it does not have a negative connotation of the goyim. It just means, thank you Hashem for making me who I am, for giving me the opportunity to serve you, to strengthen the pride. Another blessing we say is, Thank you for having chosen us from all the nations. It doesn't mean the other nations are no good. It just means for having chosen us and given us this important mission. We're very happy that you gave us this. We're very proud of it. So all these blessings regularly said every morning, people rush through them. And they don't always know what they're saying. But the idea is to pay attention to every word we're saying, to strengthen from the moment we wake up, not late at night, from the moment we wake up and we go to work, and sometimes we work with Goyim. Just realize who you are. Be proud of it. And don't be ashamed of it. Uh, the Navi, the Prophet, said something similar. The Navi, in speaking and rebuking the Jewish people, he would remind them, Habitual Surhut Saftem. Look back where you come from. Look at your source. Who were your fathers? Who were your grandparents? Even those who grew up in countries where there was no Jewish education, like in Russia. If you go back a few generations, people were righteous, tzaddikim, rabbis in the family. In every family, if you go back several generations, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. You speak to any Moroccan Jew, because you know who my grandfather was. And I tell him, I don't want to know who your grandfather was. I want to know why you are not like your grandfather. <laughs> you know, don't tell me about your grandfather. Everybody has somebody in the family. Abitur Tzulchu Satem, the prophet, says, just look up back. Go back a few generations and see how righteous your parents, your grandparents were before. And uh, that is something that we should be inspired. We should uh, look at them for inspiration. If they were willing to sacrifice everything, do you know that in Russia, if, if you lived in a small town and there was no mikveh, the, the women went to the lake, and even if it was winter, they broke the ice just so they can maintain their family purity laws. There were stories even in Moscow till recently, till before uh, the communism fell, where people had an, an entrance to the mikveh through a closet, because they, they of course, wanted to hide this from the communists, but they very much held of it, and they did everything they can to fulfill this mitzvah, or this great, important mitzvah. So our forefathers were very, very special people. We only have to go back a few generations, a little surchot sakem, and remember how they were pride and they were happy, and they were not embarrassed of being Jewish. So that was one of the questions they asked Yosef. How did you preserve your identity? How did you maintain your Jewishness? Yosef was very proud. He always knew who he was. He did not assimilate. Then they asked Yosef, tell us Yosef, all right, you became the ruler. Why you and not any of the other brothers? And it was, what zechut? You must have some zechut. They may not have asked it in this word, but I'm trying to paraphrase uh, what they may have asked. Yosef, what the who do you have to become the ruler of this time of all the twelve brothers? What was so special about Yosef? Now we know by now that there's something called Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David. We know that Hashem has a plan. Yosef is the firstborn of Rachel. Yehuda happens to be, even though he's the fourth child of Rachel, of Leah, nevertheless he's special. Mashiach comes out from him. There's something special about that lineage. But what is so special about Yosef that he becomes a temporary ruler in a foreign land? In Egypt, imagine a Jew becoming a prime, a prime minister in England or the president of the United States. Right? It's, uh, even though he was the second in command, it was still a major achievement. Madua Yosef Zachalik Dula, in what merit does Yosef become the ruler of Egypt? So at some point in their conversation, Yosef wants to convince further his brothers that it's him. He tells them, I'm speaking your language. What else does he do? He shows them his Brit Milah. I'm circumcised. Therefore, believe me, it's me, it's Yosef. There's a famous question about that. What kind of proof is that, that he's circumcised? Many of the Egyptians were circumcised. Yosef even demanded of the Egyptians, you want food? Circumcise yourself. Many Egyptians circumcise themselves. 
during the Holocaust, the Germans used to sometimes make people take off their pants to see if they're Jewish or not. And many times they were wrong because there were Christians and there were Muslims who were circumcised too. There was, but many times you can tell who was Jewish. So here, how could they tell? How could they be convinced that Yosef was in fact Yosef when many people were circumcised? So my father said that perhaps what he meant to tell his brothers is there's a secret that only me and you know. Nobody else knows about the Brit Milah. I was born circumcised. Yaakov was born circumcised. Yosef was born circumcised. There was no circumcision. Sometimes children are born without an orla, without the foreskin. And Yosef was born of that. And only the brothers knew. Yeah, Yosef was different. He was born with Adon Ola. He was born circumcised. That information that he was giving them, that only they knew. Okay. And that way he proved to them, to their satisfaction, that it was Yosef. But Yosef is talking about something else when he's showing them his Brit Milah. He's saying that this hood that I watched over my Brit Milah, I did not defile it. I did not make it Tameh with the Goim. That is how I rose to power. And the Kabbalah very much speaks about the importance, the sanctity of the Brit Milah. The one can rise to great levels of a Kedusha, great levels of Kedusha, the greatest levels of all, only by observing the Kedusha of the Brit Milah, being very careful with it. The Zohar says that anybody who circumcised will not go to Gehenom. However, what about all those who committed many sins? Well, the Brit Milah protects one. However, that's only in condition that he did not defile his Brit Milah, even though he has took care of his Brit Milah and removed the Orla, uh, but if he defiled it, if he made a Tameh with Goyot, with Goyim, for example, then of course uh, that uh, would not give him the same Zahut. So what the Zohar says that he does not see Gehenom, it's not just for having the Brit Milah, but it's also in condition that he did not make a Tameh. Another idea of why Yosef, perhaps, Zachal Ligdula, why he merited this tremendous important position in Egypt, is because if you notice, when Yosef meets up with his brothers, what does he do? After they embrace and they hug, Vayef Yosef Alehav. He actually cried and hugged his brothers. He cries on their shoulder. He doesn't say they cried on him. The commentaries tell us that that is one of the characteristics that a leader should have. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned for his fellow Jew, he cared about them. Yosef is showing by this kind of behavior that he cares. He cares about everyone, every single Jew. That is something Yosef had. That is a very important midah, an important characteristic. And it could be because of that too. Yosef is the one that's chosen to be the leader. It's interesting that it reminds me, we're talking about Yosef, it is our tradition that there were three candidates, three great people who were candidates to put together the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch, as you know, is a compilation of all the laws that we need to know today. There were three important candidates. And the one chosen at the end in Hashemayim was Rabbi Yosef Karo. Why was he chosen? Because he was the most humble one of all. So we see that greatness is achieved by one's character. In other words, how does one come to certain positions? How does one come to certain levels? By his character. By being humble, by being kind, by being caring. And that is, these are the characteristics that Yosef had which allowed him to become the leader of Egypt. All right. So Yosef and his brothers met. Now everybody knows the truth. Now it's time to break the news to Yaakov. And that's not so easy. He's older. You can't just break the news just like that. And the Midrash says how they did it slowly. They sent a little girl to sing to him, Oh Yosef, hi. That Yosef is still alive. And sure enough, eventually he finds out. But as soon as he finds out and it sinks in, the Torah says, Vayakog libo. He was disbelieving. He didn't really believe what he was hearing. And the commentaries tell us that this whole event of Yosef revealing himself, Yaakov finding out and not believing it, is a description of the generation of Mashiach. Our time, our generation. That there will be despair. People will lose hope. People will think Mashiach is not coming. But Yaakov Libo, and his heart was disbelieving. There will be Yehush. Yehush means to give up hope. Imagine you're living during the Holocaust and you're seeing a complete destruction of Europe. You're disbelieving. You would never think, you know. Your heart is broken. You wouldn't think about Mashiach. But that is exactly the description of the times, the hard times, where people will be in disbelief. And after all the disbelief, after all the hardships and after all the pain, at the very end, Yaakov sees the Agalot. He sees all the carriages, all the chariots coming. And that, of course, enlivens him and reassures him that the fact is that Yosef is alive. And so 
many of us are not sure, many of us do not believe, but uh, in reality, if you pay close attention to what's going on in the world, it's, it's almost impossible to not to believe. It's, it's very, very close. And soon, and very, very soon, those who are still in this belief will see it very, very clearly. So Yaakov finds out, and he's on his way to meet his son, Yosef. On his way, the Torah describes that he brought the Vachim, that he brought some sacrifices. Sacrifices are gratitude. He thanks the Kadosh Baruch Hu for everything, for allowing him to still see Yosef. But there's something else. There's a very important point in his gratitude. In his expression of gratitude, Yaakov basically says, now I understand that everything that has happened is a tovah. Everything was me'ashamayim. Everything was for the good. And even though I suffered so much and I lived through so much pain, I realized that everything was for the good. And the rabbi tells that that is one of the most important expressions that a Jew should get used to saying regularly. Everything that Hashem does is for the good. And they tell us in other words that we should always get used to saying Gamzu Tovah. You get a flat tire, just remember, Gamzu Tovah. Even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning in Watts, South Central Los Angeles, Gamzu Tovah. Kaparat if you want to use different words. Everything is for the good. Somebody gave you a slap and spit at you, Gamzu Tovah. It may be hard. You may, you may feel like slapping him. You may feel like <laughs> doing something. Just remember, nothing happens for no reason. Nothing whatsoever. Unless, of course, we do it to ourselves. If somebody smokes and he is injuring himself, that, you know, that is not an Hashemai, that you're doing yourself. But any other event that is not within our com- control, and most things are not within our control, except for the fulfillment of mitzvot or averot. Other than that, nothing is really too much in our control. And therefore, we must remember at all times that everything is in a shamayim, and everything is the tovah. It doesn't mean that Hashem tells people to do things for us, or to us, but He, he allows it, and if He allows it, there must be a reason for it. It doesn't mean that Hashem told Hitler to do what He did. Obviously not. Hitler had a plan, and Hashem said, I'm staying out. That's called Aster Panim. Hashem hides his face. It doesn't mean he sent him. It doesn't mean he told him. He's guilty of doing what he did. And so are, are all those who helped him. But Hashem allowed it to happen. He allows these things to happen for whatever reason that he has. So everything is in Hashemayim and everything has some purpose. Everything is in the Tovah. Yaakov discovers this now. Yosef also learns this lesson very much because Yosef also had some difficulties in understanding why he landed in jail if he didn't do anything wrong. He was accused of something he never did. He's being sold into slavery. He has problems too. And he also had a hard time understanding what's going on over here. And only after learning his lesson, after seeing everything, does he realize where all of this is leading. Where is all of this leading? It's leading him to power. He didn't know this at first when his brothers threw him in the pit, when the brothers sold him into slavery. Had he known this is what's going to happen, he would have said, okay, do it, thank you very much, go ahead. <laughs> See, nobody knows at first why things happen. We only know it later on. But it's too bad that we only know it later on because we've suffered so much, we've had so much heartache, we've been depressed and sad and disappointed, all these feelings, for no reason. Because we, we should know that it's all the Tova. Everything is for, the, for a purpose, for a reason. And that is why Yosef, when he meets up with his brothers, his brothers feel terrible. Sorry, sorry for having done what we did to you. Please forgive us. But don't worry. It's not you who sold me into slavery. It's Hashem. Hashem sent me to be able to support all these nations, all these countries at a time of hunger and starvation. Hashem sent me to manage the affairs of Egypt for good reason. And as he says in Parshat Vayechi, after Yaakov passes away, he reassures his brothers again. They think he's going to take revenge now that Yaakov passed away. He says, don't worry. You thought to harm me? Hashem had a different plan than you. Hashem had a good plan. You thought of doing something bad to me, but at the same time, it was Hashem's plan to do something good to me. So don't worry about it. He reassures them it wasn't you. Even though you were involved, and you, of course, are to blame for what you did, and you have to do Teshuvah for what you did, but nevertheless, in all of that, Hashem had a totally different plan. And that plan was a positive, and it was a good plan. Another very important point that we see from all of this is that even if a person is in the middle of a tzara, he's in jail, or any other problem. He should never give up hope. It's very possible that from this tzara, something good will happen. I think it was last week that we spoke about the fact that Yosef gets out of jail, and uh, we see that the person should never give up hope. Sooner or later, a 
Kadosh Baruch Hu will release us from our tzarot, we will recover from anything that we're suffering from. That is also true. Never give up hope. But here there's another point. We see that even if somebody is going through a tzara, from the tzara something actually good can eventually happen. So it may appear to us bad or no good, but in reality this is what's necessary to uh, to get to where we need to get to. As there is a mashal brought down by the commentaries of a uh, Jew that was drafted into the army, and he knew nothing about armies, nothing about being a soldier. He was out of shape. And you know, whoever knows what an army is like, they make you go through a lot of uh, exercise, arduous work to get you into shape, and it's not easy. Especially if you want to be in the commandos, in the Golani, in Israel, they make you walk with a heavy load, and not everybody passes. Or in this country, I think it's the Green Berets. It's much more difficult, the SEALs, the Navy SEALs, it's much more difficult to succeed. And there was this one guy who was drafted, who was suffering a lot because of all of this, because he was not fit for this. And his friends felt bad for him. Several years went by, and the friends who felt bad for him five years ago meet up with him. And right now he's one of the officers. So they say, I guess it's not bad after all. If from all that suffering, from all those difficulties, you were able to become an officer, so it's not bad after all. <laughs> In the very beginning, it appears that this was, who knows, you know, some Gehenom, you know, for him. But in the end, he became an officer. So even if somebody is going through some difficult time, it's very possible that from that difficulty, something good will grow. Something good will come out. As we see, that is exactly what happened to Yosef. It appears bad, but in the end, everything will become good. Towards the end of Parashat Vayikash, there is some bad news. What's the bad news? It appears good, but it's really not too good. The last words of Parashat Vayikash is that Am Yisrael is going down to Egypt, and they procreate and multiply in the land. But there's a word over here that is a little bit uh, not too reassuring. In other words, a word that tells us that, unfortunately, Am Yisrael is making roots in this line, Vayeshev Yisrael Beres Yisrael Beres Goshem Vayah Hazuba Vayeshru Vayeshru Vayah Hazuba means that they settle down firmly and that's no good why not? because Akhalos Baruch meant them to be Gerim to get Yez Zaracha that your seed will be a stranger in a strange land that they will not be there permanently but unfortunately as it has happened throughout history whether it was in Spain or in Babylonia or elsewhere People set up their businesses, several generations of the same family in the same business, and people made roots. Vaya Hazuba means the Jewish people, after coming down to Egypt, made roots in this new land. And they adopted some of their culture too. And that's not too good. Because when a Jew makes roots, he thinks this is his home. And what did the rabbis do in the prayer book? Everything to remind us about Sion. Everything to remind us about the Beit HaMikdash. So we should not forget. But unfortunately, Jews in Europe did forget. They considered Berlin, Yerushalayim, they said. Jews in Spain, during the golden era in Spain, they were very comfortable there. They weren't dreaming about going to Israel. I want to ask you, who in this city of Los Angeles, who lives in Hancock Park, and has a 7,000 square foot mansion with eight bathrooms, with uh, three cars, with two maids, with a million dollar salary, is he thinking about moving to Eretz Israel? No, not necessarily, unless he's very idealistic, he's not, it's not even in the back of his mind. Because he's very comfortable here. And that is why the rabbis in the Siddur and elsewhere reminded us that this is not our home, this is the Kalut. But unfortunately, Amistad goes down to Egypt and they make roots. How do we, how do we make sure we don't make strong roots? What should we do? One thing is to be very careful not to adopt any of the customs of the Goyim. So Allah says, Lot al who got a Goyim, be careful not to emulate their ways, not to dress up like them, not to follow their customs and their traditions. One typical example would be not to go to a bull match. You know what a bull match is? You know, like in Spain? Is that how, the, is that how a bull fight? I'm sorry, a bull fight in English? Yeah? Because that's, you know, you know what they do? They kill the bull. They, yeah, torture, they torture it. All of that, associating, associating with them, doing what they're doing, seeing what they're doing, and believe it or not, even eating turkey on Thanksgiving. It's not necessarily the best thing to do. But there's nothing wrong with it. You can, if you love turkey, especially the filling, go ahead and eat it. There's no isur whatsoever. Because what is Thanksgiving? We give Thanksgiving to Hashem every day. Every meal. So it's not really a sur. 
there's no real prohibition. But I use it as an example as even something so subtle, a small custom of this country, we really should disassociate ourselves with it. Somebody invites you, okay, you can eat. There's no prohibition because it's not paganism. It's not krasma. It's not Halloween, which also has its roots in paganism. However, we want to stay as far as possible, maintain a distance, and not mingle with them. So not even the turkeys. It's important to be strict with everything that we have, with the alakot, even with customs that are not written in the Shulchan Aruch necessarily. And I'm going to tell you a story of a, of a custom on how it was able to save a Jewish child. There was a Hasid who came to say goodbye to his rabbi. He's moving to Australia. And the rabbi, of course, gave him his blessings and wished him the best. And he tells this Hasid, oh, by the way, before you leave, give your son a halaka. Halaka is, you know, when they cut the hair for the first time and they make peot. Does anybody know when that is done? How old is the, ba- is the child then? Three years old, approximately, right? Because that's the, ch- the age when the child begins his chinuch, begins to say pesukim, to read Torah. That is when they prepare him with his peot. That is when they give him tzitzit. That is the time of him. Tells the Hasid, even though your child is two years old, I want you to make the halakha now. He doesn't ask, he's a Hasid, he doesn't ask his rabbi, why? Two years old? All right. Now, after you make the halakha, the child has peot, and he has a kippah too. Anyway, that's what he did, and he went on to Australia. Somehow, somewhere in the airport, the child got lost. And they couldn't find him. They tried and looked everywhere. They couldn't find him. They had no choice, and they, and they went home. And they gave a report. An officer at the airport saw this child. And as soon as he saw the child, he recognized that this was a Jewish child because of the peot and the kippah. So he immediately contacted the Jewish community. He didn't know about the report or anything. He immediately contacted the Jewish community and said, a Jewish child was found. Please find his parents. And that is how the child was eventually uh, brought together with his parents. All because of the rabbi's foresight. You go into the galut, have your peot and your kippah, identify you as a Jew. And that is how the child was able to get to his parents quickly, because of his peot. We see a small custom, nevertheless an important custom. Going over to Parashat Vayahi now. In the beginning of Parashat Vayahi, the Torah tells us, Vayikrevu Yemei Israel Lamut. In the days of Yaakov, Israel approached his death. What do we have to know this for? I mean, there are various explanations as to what the Torah is trying to tell us, but the word Vayikrevu means as follows. There is a system in place that Hashem created, which determines from the moment the person is born how long he will live. Vayikrevu is that system. There's a system that a person gets closer and closer to that time that has been determined when he was born of when he was going to die. However, there is another system that extends life and there's a system that also shortens life. What that means is that even though Chabosh Baruch Hu has given us a certain number of years to live and that is predetermined from the moment we were born, nevertheless there are times where a person can extend his life by doing certain acts, certain mitzvot, or that Chazor Shalom, he can shorten his life. There's a system that increases and a system that decreases. The typical example of a life being increased by an additional 15 years is the story of Hizkiyahu the king, where the, where the prophet tells him, you don't want to have children, Hashem tells me to tell you that you're going to die. And he repents, and he does the Shubai, and he cries his heart out to Hashem, and the word comes back from the prophet, you've been granted an additional 15 years. Life has been extended. And there are many stories of people's lives being extended because of something that they did. An opposite example of one's life being shortened is the life of a Hazya, the king, who was not such a good king. And he became very, very sick. And as he was sick, Uddarash Zarah, he went to those who are involved with idolatry and asked them advice of what will happen to him. He said, imagine like somebody today going to somebody who reads tarot cards or crystal balls. We have prophets. Why do you go to these people? It's a chelul Hashem, the desecration of Hashem's name. Because you went to these people to consult with them, lo You will not get out from your sick bed. And therefore he died before his time, in other words. He got sick and died. So Hashem can increase and decrease one's life depending on one's ma'asim. That happens too. However, even though Yaakov eventually passes away, the rabbi tells Yaakov Lomet, Yaakov did not die. And what does that mean? 
Various explanations given on those words. What does it mean Yaakov did not die? We know physically he passed away. They buried him. But one of the ideas is that Yaakov may have physically died, but his influence did not die. Many people, when they live this world, they are gone physically, and they are gone in every other way too. People have completely forgotten about them. There's nothing left. But as the rabbis tell us to the king, even when they are passed away, they're still alive. Because the words they said and what they taught has left an impression for many, many generations to come. So they have not really died. All the rabbis in the Gemara that we read and learn every day, they're still alive. They're still influencing, they're still affecting our lives. The Yaakov's influence that he had has not died. He's still with us till today. Yaakov, before he passes away, has an important request from Yosef. Don't bury me in Egypt. And he gives him three reasons. In the Torah, you only see basic, the basic request. I want to be buried together with my family, with my father, with my grandfather. Take me back to my land. But Rashi brings down what the rabbis tell us, that Yaakov gave various reasons why he doesn't want to be in Egypt. Reason number one, eventually there will be a plague of life, and that's going to also affect my body in the grave. He didn't want the Egyptians to make him an idol. And he did not want to be buried in Hutzla, it's outside of Israel, because those who are buried outside of Israel, eventually when Hayata Mekim occurs, they will need to roll. In other words, they will have to go through a little bit of pain, uh, and it would just be better to be b- buried in Eretz Yisrael and get up there than having to roll. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so it's, Yaakov gives various explanations as to why he doesn't want Egypt. Why does he have to give so many explanations? Just basically tell yourself, you know what, I just want to be with my, my parents. I want to be with my grandparents. And perhaps one of the reasons why he so emphasizes the importance of being buried in Eretz Yisrael and not in Egypt is because he wants to diminish the value of Egypt in the eyes of the Jews. Egypt is not a good place to remain. Egypt is not a good place to stay. In other words, so he talks so much about getting out of here. This is no good. There's going to be a plague over here. So he emphasizes the importance of leaving here and going to Israel, even after his death, to remind the Jewish people that this is not your home. Don't get stuck up. Even though if you have comfortable businesses, even if you comfortable life, and you're very much established, this is not a place to stay. That is why the rabbis always praise the importance of settling in Israel. So much so that they said, a Jew should be willing to live in a, a city whose the majority population is not Jewish, but it's in Israel, the city, versus a city that the majority of the population is Jewish, but it's outside of Israel. In other words, you're better off living in Ramallah than in Bora Park. Not today, because Ramallah is dangerous. But the idea is, you're better off living... In Israel, even if the city is not completely Jewish, because the the many, many benefits of living in Israel. And the Kabbalah elaborates greatly on the the benefits of being buried in Eretz Israel. In the book, a sefer called Chesed Avraham, he elaborates about all those who have lived in Israel and who have sacrificed their lives to live in Israel. The Sechah, the reward that they will receive when Mashiach comes, will be greater than those that lived off the fat of the land outside of Israel, in America. And we will complain, how come they're getting more than we? And Mashiach will answer, because they gave up all the luxuries to live in Israel, just to live in Israel. They deserve more. And the reward of these Jews will be much greater. The same is true with those who are buried in Israel, in Eretz Israel. The benefits of being buried in that land are much more than being buried outside. Then the question, of course, you may ask, then why isn't everybody moving their dead to Eretz Israel? What about all the great rabbis who are buried in Kusayim? There's reasons for everything. People have cheshbonot about family, a family plot, being close to the, the parent who has passed away. You don't have to send the dead to Eretz Israel, especially if that individual did not have a connection with Israel. The Zohar says as follows. The Zohar says that Eretz Israel does not want dead bodies. To, in other words, he does not want Jews to come after they have died to Israel and defile the land with their Tumah. So therefore, a Jew who had a connection with Eretz Yisrael, who lived there for a number of years, visited Eretz Yisrael every year, he had a connection, he loved Israel, he supported Israel, and he wants his body to be buried there, Eretz Yisrael will accept him. But if one has lived all his life in Chusrael, just just wants to be buried there, the land of Israel says, stay where you are, I don't want your dead body here. I have nothing to do with you. But there's no doubt that there are great benefits of living and being buried in Eretz Israel.
So what, what does Yaakov do right before he passes away? He gives instructions, he gives blessings, and he gives some advice. Let's first talk about the advice and the blessings that he gives to the children of Yosef, because they came first. What does, he, what does he say about the children of Yosef? He says as follows. When he blesses the Ephraim of Nasheh, he blesses them as follows. Am Israel will bless their children in the future that may they be like Ephraim and Nashe. That is how we, that is how fathers bless their children. Why like Ephraim and Nashe? What's so special about Ephraim and Nashe? Yaakov is telling us the future generations, future generations, who bless their kids like Ephraim and Menashe. What's so special about Ephraim and Menashe? Ephraim and Menashe were the only ones who were born in, and raised in the Galut, in the Diaspora. And they survived. They remained Jews. And Yaakov wants to bless future generations, future children of Am Yisrael. May you be like Ephraim and Menashe. That is the best blessing, that is the most important blessing that a father could ever want for his children, that he, that the children should be like him, that the children should go in the footsteps of his forefathers. And that is the message that Yaakov is giving. That they should all be like Ephraim and Nashe. There was no envy also between Ephraim and Nashe. They were good brothers to each other. That's another idea. This is the type of Jews Yaakov wants. Everybody should be blessed with this kind of a blessing. Then he adds, when he says Amalach Goel, he adds the words, Vikarevahem Shemi V'Shem Avotai. And that their names, and that the names of Am Yisrael should be called in my name, in the name of my forefathers. What does that mean? It also means that we should preserve our Jewish names. Not Eugene, not Ike, not Bernard, not all of these names, but Jewish names. Because the change of a name is the first step to assimilation. It is subtle, it is small, it's insignificant, but that is a form of assimilation. Unless, unless of course, it's a nickname or a translation. Isaac instead of Yitzhak. That's okay. But otherwise, we all receive a Jewish name at birth, at the Brit Milah, hopefully. Uh, except for those countries that they did not give Jewish names, perhaps. But in reality, we should. That is one of our identities, our name, our kippah. How do, how do you recognize a Jew? By the clothing he wears today, everybody wears a suit and a tie. Whether you are Japanese, whether you live in Bombay, or whether you live in Cape Town, South Africa, everybody wears the same, similar suit and tie. So what makes it? Beards? There are a lot of going with beards. A kippah? Well, even the Pope wears a kippah sometimes. <laughs> yeah. No, I've seen him without one too. I've seen him without a kippah. I've seen him without it. But anyway, it's of course our observance of the mitzvot more than anything else that makes us Jews. But the name is important too. Then he tells them, he gives them some advice on what priorities should be. What should the priorities be? So he says as follows. And so forth. There are three important messages here, three requests, three ideas. And they are in their order of priority. First he says to Yosef, HaElokim Asheitallechu Avotai Lefanav. Number one in the priority list is spirituality. That you need to ask for, pray for, that you should succeed spiritually. You should survive as a Jew. Just like my forefathers, Abraham my forefathers who went and walked in the ways of Hashem. This is what we should want from our children. This should always be priority number one, their education. That we do whatever we can to make sure that they grow up and walk in the same ways that our forefathers walked. Then comes number two. Hamalach, I'm sorry, Haro'eoti me'odi adayomaze. Parnasa. We should ask for Parnasa too. But that's number two, not number one. And number three, Hamalach ha'goeloti mikorah. Ha'goeloti mikorah referring to what? Referring to being saved from all tarot, bodily harm, that we should be healthy. Health is important too, but it's not number one. Number one is that the neshama should be healthy. What good is it if the person is physically healthy? He lives to 90 years, never puts on tefillin, does not eat kosher. His neshama is not healthy. Number one, what's important is that the neshama be healthy. Even if a person lives to 35 years, that's a very young age. But he had a good life. He had a fulfilling life, a spiritual life. That's good. 
a person had a long life, but he did not do anything with his time. He wasted, he played cards, he drank, he went around the world five times. Right? What good is it? In the Kabbalah it is mentioned that when people got upstairs, when they come upstairs, even though they may have died at the age of 90, they may be two-year-olds. Somebody who may have died at 35 may be 100 years old. How could that be? And it's very simple. Over there, the, the age is by how much time you used. How do you use your time? Even though you may have physically died at the age of 90, you actually lived, li- really lived a spiritual life of only a year or two. Whereas somebody may have lived only to the age of 35, but he's much more old, he's much older than the one who lived, physically lived longer years. Spirituality is the most important thing following the Torah Mitzvot, and if you read the Haftarah of Parashat Vayichi, you will see that that is David Amelet's last words to Shlomo. He does not give him instructions about how to run the kingdom so much. What's more important about running the kingdom, he tells him, the main thing is Veshamartayt Mishmeret Hashem, that you be careful to observe the Torah and the Mitzvot. And you know what David goes on and tells him? If you do that, Leman Taskilet Kol then you will be smart and you will know how to run your country too. Number one, be careful, Lishmoret Mishmeret Hashem, observe the Torah, follow the Mitzvot. If you do that, then you will also be guided in, in how to manage the affairs of the country. Number one priority is spirituality, observance of the Torah Mitzvot. And finally, Yaakov now, right before he passed away, blesses every one of his children. And if you pay attention to the blessings, you will see that he, his blessings have a description of an animal. A wolf, a snake. Why animals? So the commentaries explain, there's two ideas over here. Is that everyone has a certain yetter, a certain evil inclination that he needs to conquer. And that's his animal. And that is why he's describing everyone, what he has to overcome, whether it's his anger, his temper, or some other problem. That is part of his mission, to overcome that yet sir, to deal with that challenge. But also, everyone is endowed with certain kohot, with certain strengths, with certain talents. Everyone has a unique mission. And Yaakov is pointing out the mission of each one. And you may think the mission of Zebulun is not so good. What's the mission of Zebulun? He's basically told that he's going to be wandering the oceans of the world. You know that the women who are married to those people who wander the oceans of the world are not too happy? They don't see their husbands for several weeks or months. So what kind of a life is that? But the real mission of Zevolun is to support Yisachar. Because, because he will be traveling and doing business, he will be able to support Yisachar and they will be good partners. So that's not so bad after all. Everybody has a mission. And because everybody has a unique mission, the rabbis tell us, don't ever say, I wish I was somebody else. I wish my life was like that. If Hashem wanted you to have a different life, He would have given you that different life. Hashem wants you to be happy with what you have because that is what's good for you. Your mission is with what you with what you have. You were created in such a way because this is the way Hashem wants you to be. Be happy with the way you are. Don't don't people think they would be happier if they were someone else, if they were doing something else. Not necessarily. You have a mission, therefore don't be jealous of somebody else either. There's no why be jealous of somebody else. His mission is only for him. Your mission is only for yourself. What he has, you're not supposed to have. What you have, he's not supposed to have. Why be jealous? No reason to be jealous of anybody else because everybody has a unique mission that's just customized for him. The Zohar says that anyone who actually fulfills his mission, being overcoming his Yetzara, Yetzara is considered an enemy, and if you're able to defeat that enemy, you will be able to defeat any other enemy. So that is, that is a very good uh, thing to do. <laughs> it's a good idea. Get rid of this enemy, you don't have to have any worries of any other enemies. Yosef, however, received this very special beracha that none of the other brothers received. Anybody know what was the special beracha that Yosef received? That the evil eye does not affect him. Anybody that comes from Yosef, Ainara, does not affect him. Wow, very special blessing. Why does Yosef get such a blessing? So my Rebbe, one of my Rebbe's, uh, Lazar Kahano, said as follows. Yosef did not have any hatred and did not have an evil eye unto others. Because he was not jealous, did not hate anybody else. He doesn't deserve that people should be jealous or affect him with their evil eye. He did not have an evil eye unto others. In other words, he was happy for others. He was not jealous of others. Then Hashem blesses him. The people will not be jealous of you. 
people will not be able to affect you with their evil eye. There is a segula to say, Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Aliyayim, Ben Asad Al Eshur, Anam Ezer Adi Yosef, Katina, the Rishal Tabe'in Adisha. I come from Yosef, from the seed of Yosef, that their evil eye does not affect. And you say various pesukim, and don't look at the, uh, don't have any eye contact with the person who's staring you in the face, in case you suspect they have an evil eye. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there who begrudge you. In other words, is that the right word? They begrudge you. They don't, they don't, they're not happy with what you have. Not that they're jealous necessarily. They just don't want you to have what you have. That's even worse. Or they're envious. They're envious, sir. Sure. Anyway, Yosef is very, very kind and giving. It's just the opposite of jealous. And how do we know that? Because even after his father passes away, he does not take revenge. On the contrary, he supports his, his family. Does not hold any grudge against them. That's very important. A lot of people, okay, would forgive, but deep down, they would hold a grudge. Let me tell you a quick story. This Rabbi Saris Talante was once in a train. And there was in his train, not too far from where he was sitting, another Jew traveling to the same destination. And this young man gave up the rabbi a hard time during the whole ride. He would at one moment tell the rabbi, open the window, because he was smoking and he wanted some fresh air. After a few moments he would tell the rabbi, why do you have the window open? It's cold. Close the window. He really gave the rabbi a hard time. But the rabbi just kept quiet and just did as the young man told him to do. Anyway, they finally arrive in town, and this young man all of a sudden sees all the people going to greet this great rabbi. He said, oh, this is great, this is important rabbi. Who is this rabbi? They thought this is Rabbi Israel Salanta. Oh, he felt terrible. Rabbi, forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I, I didn't know who you were. And the rabbi says, I forgive you, but I, I want to know what you're doing here. So he says, Rabbi, I came here to receive a certificate for Shechita, that I can slaughter animals. I want to be tested, and I need to stay here a few days to learn and prepare myself. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything for you. He took care of it, had, got him a place to stay, got him tested, got him this, this certificate, and everybody asked him, why are you going out of your way to do so much for this person who gave you such a hard time in the train? I wanted to make sure that there's nothing left over in my heart against this young man. Even though I forgave him, but sometimes deep down we feel bad, we're, we're unhappy, we hold a grudge. And therefore I went out of my way to help him, because when you help, when you give, hopefully... You develop a, a friendship with the person, not the other way around. And that, is, that way I was able to reassure myself that I had nothing against this young man. Hard times come to Am Yisrael after the Shevatim pass away. So long as the Shevatim were uh, uh, alive, the tribes, the Jews were not enslaved. It's only after the last one passed away. However, in the beginning of the Barasha, you will see, the commentaries tell us, that as soon as Yaakov passed away, Nistemu enehem v'libotehem shel Yisrael, the eyes of the Jewish people and their hearts became closed as a result of the great suffering from the Shibud, from the slavery. But wait a minute. As soon as Yaakov passed away, the tribes were still alive. The Shibud, the slavery, only began after the traps passed away. So what does it mean? That their eyes are already closing from, from the suffering. So the Svatimet explains, as soon as Yaakov passed away, what happened is, they completely forgot that they are in Galut. That in itself, forgetting that you're in a diaspora, forgetting that you're not home, that it already is called a shibut. That is already like you're being enslaved. That is already difficult times. So when it, what it means is that the eyes were blocked and their hearts were blocked. As soon as Yaakov passed away, it means that they already began, unfortunately, to assimilate and to forget that they're not in Eretz Israel during the Galut. just want to finish with one of the most important ideas in Parashat Bayechi, and that is Yaakov Bikesh Legalot Etakets. He wants to reveal the end of days. He wanted to reveal the end of days when Mashiach is coming, and Hashem did not allow him. All of a sudden, his mind was blocked. What is exactly Yaakov trying to do? So very briefly, there's two kinds of kitzim. There is a ket of Itai and a ket of Ahishena. There's the last possible moment when Mashiach can come. And there's also a time where he can come speedily. It can be tomorrow morning. It can be tonight too. That's called Ahishena. Nobody knows the ket of Ahishena, because Ahishena can be at any time. Even Daniel, who speaks about the last Kets, he says, Advarim Stumim, it's all sealed, because Hashem did not reveal it to anybody. What rabbis tried, therefore, to figure out when Mashiach is coming was always because in every generation there is a possibility of the Geulah coming. There is a Zman Mesugal. You're not allowed to figure out and estimate when Mashiach is coming, because if he doesn't come, you'll be disappointed. But there are times in every generation where he can come. And rabbis, great rabbis, try to figure those times are. Those were times of possible potential Ahishena. 
Yaakov wanted to reveal the last possible time because that he knew. He didn't know Ahishena. Nobody knows when Ahishena is. Hashem says, why do you want to do that for? Because I want to give them hope even though they will be locked away in Egypt. Eventually they'll come out of it. But Hashem says, no, instead of giving them hope, you're going to lead them to more despair. Because the Ket of Ita is so far removed from now. You're going to tell him he's coming in 3,000 years from now. Is that going to give them hope? No. Besides that, I want them to pray to me, and I want them to, to be good, so they can bring Mashiach even sooner than that. To bring them in Hashem. So what good is it that you tell them the final Ket? So Hashem took it away from him, and did not allow Yaakov to reveal when the Mashiach will come. The Malvim, however, says that in our generation, it's okay to discuss the timing of Mashiach because of the following parable. There was once a father who went on a big trip with his son. The son always asked the father, when are we getting there? The father didn't answer. When are we getting there? Didn't answer. Until finally, as soon as they're approaching their final destination, now the father tells him, we're only a few miles away. Why didn't you tell me that before? Had I told you many weeks or months ago when we set out on a journey, we have weeks or months to go, what good would it have done to you? All that information would have been useless to you. Now it makes more sense. Prepare yourself, because we're getting there. Now it makes more sense for us to talk about it. That is why the Malbim and many great rabbis have discussed the coming of the Mashiach, because it's very imminent. And even though we're, we know it's going to happen in stages, it doesn't happen in one shot, but we are, we are in the midst of it. We see it, it's very, very clearly. And the Zat Hashem, the main thing we have to pray for is that the that there should be no more suffering, no more pain, and that the the ingathering of all of Am Yisrael should be with Rahamin, should be with a lot of mercy in a very miraculous way in the same way that we experience the miracles of Hanukkah, we will experience the same miracles and even greater miracles very very soon, Zat Hashem.